Okay, week three. Beautiful. So without further ado, let's talk about the homework. So uh, we wanted to have a system that has customers, a concept of customers and orders and items. And customers can order these items and each order can include more than one item. That's the basic idea, sort of a basic shopping cart model. So what do we need for order to have line items? So this is the, uh, this is the object model I came up with in the end. So we have people that have that was already in our database. Now, based on Joop's comment from last time actually about STI, I thought it would be nice to derive the customer from the people. So it's the same table, but it uses the STI de derivative. So then the order item, the order on the item. So the question, how, how can an order have many line items? Generally, you need some sort of join table in the middle, one that joins the order with the item. So each order can have multiple items and each item can show up on multiple orders. That is the basic idea. So the question is how can you validate that the state has exactly two characters and, and not one or three? Yeah, there is a validates uh, length of method. Let's start there actually. Let's start there. Let's start there. Okay, so addresses, that was the question, right? So address spec models, address spec. So here's it. And uh, let's see. I'm on customer spec. Thank you. Address spec. Okay, so I have, you know, I have some stuff in here. So I have uh, street, city, and zip state. Actually, this is another topic I wanted to discuss. Perfect. Good example. There's something called subject. Actually, Carmen pointed out to me last time that we're not using our spec to the fullest. So here's the way to use it to the fullest. Um, thanks to Carmen. So um, you can use, it's actually very clever, you can use a subject to avoid a little repetition. And I will show you that in a more formal way. For example, we had this example here, you know, it must have a street, the address. Now, typically in our test cases, we always set up some test data, like we set up the a equals address.new, or we do that in the before, in the before clause. Now, you can actually use the subject method uh, to make a little shortcut of it. You could specify subject address new, and then you can make your test case like this, should not be valid. This will call subject dot should not be valid, and subject is assigned to the address new. So subject is the placeholder for the thing you're trying to test here, because our test in this describe talks about address. And uh, it flows nicely with, with the description of our spec, you know, describe address do subject. This is what we're talking about here in this test case, namely subject validation, for example, must have a street. And it should not be valid if there is no street present. And then you can say subject.errors.on street should not be nil. If you call should or should not, you can actually leave off subject dot. This could say subject dot should not be valid. But if you call should right away within this context here, it's the first thing that would be called. Um, so the should is automatically called on subject by default. If you're calling something else like the errors, then you have to put the subject explicitly. So what... The, the, the pound, yes, that is another, thank you. That's also optional. So this whole declaration subject address new, you can put there, but if what the thing your subject, if the thing you are currently testing, the thing that you have a subject of is the same as you are having to describe up here, then it's optional. If you put a class name here, this is a class and this is not, oops, this is not a string. If you put a class name here, then subject by default makes an address dot new without any declaration. So what I'm doing here is, you know, I, I recast our standard validation test for street, city, zip, and state into subject.send uh, adder equal nil. What does this mean? It sets the attribute I'm trying to test to nil. Then uh, it verifies it should not be valid. And then it checks that the error is on the right attribute. Line 11 is a little different from what we had last time actually set explicitly to nil, the thing I'm trying to test right now. The reason is that the subject here is actually a factory. 
comes from a factory which builds an address that has all the fields populated. So this is another way to check for validity. Okay, I agree to your question. Uh, here's, the, here's the test for two. It requires a state to be length two. So if I set this to uh, three, it should not be valid. And then I get errors on the state. Uh, how is that implemented? Implementation is, oops. Implementation is address. Validates length of is two. Yes, we should. The, the so the test doesn't check for one. Test for one. That's a good question. What is? Yes. What is? What's enough and what's too much? Right? Yeah. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit about controller testing. In this case here, it depends. So my line of my rule of thumb is. Uh, it depends what API you're using. If you make two rules, so it so happens, you know, I went to look this up, you know, I didn't remember this either. So if you hit control Q and your Ruby mine actually pops up the definition right now. Uh, and it says here validates length of blah, blah, blah is the exact size of the attribute. So that's one way to do it. You could also specify the minimum and the maximum. Now, if you use this minimum maximum, you end up with two options and then you should probably test for both. But if you put only one parameter in that satisfies your test requirement, chances are you're all right with one test. That's my rule of thumb. If you put an extra option that checks another condition, you should put another test. So here was another question. What, what did I do with the state? <laughs> um, so I have put another rule in to uh, leave the state to not require the state. If the country is not the US, not everybody has states. Um, and I said here allow blank true so it's okay to be blank now when it's okay to be blank I don't decide in this line I decide in the previous line I decide that the state can be blank you see this up here so the uh, the presence rule only oops, sorry the presence rule only applies if this proc returns true that's another way to uh, vary or to customize the validation rules. Um, the validation rules have many parameters and I encourage you to read them. If you find a question like that, uh, it's helpful. I keep, keep referring to the documentation here. Let's talk about the other models that we need, the order model, the order items model. So here's my migration. So first of all, I added a type to the people table. The reason I did this is because I want to use a customer model that's derived from the people model or from the person model rather, using single table inheritance or STI. So what is that? What is single table inheritance? Single table inheritance is simply the fact that my customer model is not derived from active record base, but it is derived from person. Person is the base class which uh, derives from active record base. What does this give me? It gives me some stuff. It gives me everything that the person class already has. It gives me all the associations, the validation rules, the name scopes, and all the methods. And then I can put custom stuff that only applies to the customer. I can put that here. Like the person doesn't have many orders, but the customer does. Or the person doesn't uh, have a loyalty program, but the customer does. And um, the person has the, the, the customer's items, the person doesn't. The only requirement is that the database carry a type field. So don't be tempted to ever use the, the word type as a column name in a database table unless it's for that. It uh, uses, it's get, it gets used by active record to store the type, the, the textual name of the model in the table. Now, when should you use this? That's in some ways, you know, the the age-old discussion of when is it good to use inheritance over aggregation. Um, I generally find it useful if I want to reuse large parts of the base class, like I want to reuse the association that it already has, I want to reuse the validation rules that it already has, and I want to put some custom behavior on top of it that, that specializes that derived class. 
that's how it works well in Active Record. Um, if you're talking about a more general concept of derivation versus aggregation, there's other reasons and there's design patterns. But this is stuff that is very esoteric and, and for the pragmatic practical view, I find that, I find that rule most su suitable and useful to derive every time you have some base class stuff that you want to reuse and the table is going to be the same or largely the same. Okay, so um, let's see back to the database. Uh, migration. So then I created an orders table which looks like this. Very simple. The order is actually very, very simple. It has only one relevant column, the customer ID in it. Uh, that's all there is in timestamps. So the order could also, presumably down the road, if you flesh this out, the order could do some, could contain a, a billing information or, you know, credit card transaction information or stuff like that that re is relevant to the order or shipping or whatnot. Um, but the order actually doesn't contain the items. The order just references a customer. Now, who contains the items? That is this other table. So the question is, why do I not have orders underscore ID? The add index syntax is uh, to name the table first that I want to add this index to, and then I name the column that I want to index. Notice the table, the table creation ends here. So I'm not aware that I can actually stick the index, index into the table creation. That would be nice. Yeah, but you have to list the indices afterwards, right? So the first uh, uh, argument is the table, and you can hit Control Q again, and then it shows you here: um, add index table name, column name, options. Okay. Um, so the next item, uh, next uh, table I created. Actually, this this migration contains two table. There's no rule that says you cannot have more than one table in a migration. Generally, I don't do it unless it really they come together in some way. There's some business reason or some architectural reason to, that they really should be together. In this case, there was. So I created a table with items. The items have names, <laughs> descriptions, and a price, uh, but no no IDs of any sort. And then the thing that mediates everything that sticks it all together is the order items with an order ID and an item ID. So from here, we have models. The order, the order item belongs to an order on an item. So that's the line item on the order. <laughs> Good question. Did I write this by hand or did I generate this in the command line? I wrote the first bit on the command line, create items, and then I realized I did this other table anyway. So I just stuck that in there. So I, this part I wrote by hand, the first bit was generated. Yes, another good point, which I realized later. Uh, the Rails default, you're referring to uh, has and belongs to many relationships, right? So you, you see where this is going. This is going to a has many through relationship. Uh, by default, Rails can pick up a join table on its own without a model being there, if you name it correctly. In that case, you have to list the uh, subtables that it refers to alphabetically, and I didn't do that here. And they should be plural, yes, items and orders. I, I didn't like that because uh, what I really wanted to express is the items on the order. So I changed that. But I realized later that actually I'm, not, I'm off the convention for has and belongs to many. This thing actually would be suitable for has belongs to many. Um, has and belongs to many is something I haven't talked much about and I'm not going to. It's, it's largely obsolete now. Uh, but it's a way to, to join two tables together through a join table and you don't have to put the middle one as a separate model, which I do have a model here for the order items. There's no, there's no reason really to use has belongs to many. It has one sec. Has one other disadvantage, namely you cannot add additional fields. So down the road you might think, oh, okay, um, you want to add something else here, such as like shipped, you know, like if you have order ships in multiple parts, you know, uh, shipped at. So that would no longer be possible. Oh, it needs to be date time. So there is oftentimes a reason to put additional data onto the join table. No, this is still wrong. Um, date time. Shouldn't talk in time at the same time. Um, that would be totally sensible to have, but if you have a has many through relationship, you cannot do that. And I want to show you the order item. What's the dependent destroy about? Here's another one. 
That's the question. Dependent destroy means if the, in this case, the item, if the item gets deleted, then its join records get deleted also. That's actually an important data integrity piece um, because uh, if you don't do that, then you have this joint with all this junk left over that is dangling, has dangling foreign keys. And it's not necessarily harmful because it doesn't get looked up anywhere, but it just clutters up your database. And I, I tend to view clutter as, as generally increasing your cost of maintenance and your cost of change because then a new developer comes on and he sees all the records and he's going to be afraid to delete them. And so keeping your cost of change low probably requires you to put that there. Uh, we haven't looked at the tests yet. Let's look at the tests for this. Item spec. So um, here's the item spec. So you know I did some stuff with subject, uh, run of the mill verification of the presence of these objects. And then here's the popularity ranking. So one of the exercises was to figure out what are the most popular items? Like what are the most commonly ordered items? of the store. And uh, here's my test for that. Let me pull that up higher. So what I did, I created some demo data. This comes back, somebody asked a question on the mailing list, how do I make sure that my data is non-trivial? Um, and this is how you do it. So you set up something that is, uh, that actually gives you a sensible outcome, which uh, would not be possible if your data was too simple. So I set up three different items. And I made an item factory here, and I call it three times. So this looks a bit complicated. So it's three times, that generates an array. Um, then I call inject. Do you guys know what inject is? No, yes, sort of handle. <laughs> right, so inject starts with this value that's in the parentheses, that's an empty array. The final output of this is an array of items three items in this case. So inject runs, evaluates this block every time through the loop, and it gives me the previous result from the previous iteration through the loop in the first variable, and it gives me the incoming elements i, like in this case it would be zero, one, and two, incoming elements of the array in the second variable. So. And initially it starts out with a blank array, right? This is the initial value. It starts out with a blank array here and this loop of variable I'm not using. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a factory item and stick it into the array and I return from this the result, which is now the array with one factory element in it. Now then it loops again and now it passes in the array with one element and I append to it another factory item. Now I have two, and then it does it one more time. And it does it once for each element in this iteration. So this is a, this causes it to run through it three times. So what I end up with is an array with three factory elements. Now you might wonder, are they all gonna be the same items or are they gonna be different items? And how does, it, how does the factory know how to make different items every time it's called? Um, that is done with the factory feature that I want to illustrate. Factory girl again, yes. There's other uh, data setup tools, but this one is the one I use. And uh, down here in small print, uh, I have the item. So this is my definition for the item factory. And uh, I use the sequence feature. So both the name and the price are using sequence. What this means is uh, it evaluates this block every time the factory is called anew and it sticks in a new number. The sequence gives me incrementing numbers every time, integers. So I end up with product one, two, three here, and I end up with prices that start at 400, 401, 402. So this is a way to create unique attributes in the factory on multiple invocations. Uh, all right, back to the items. So then I create some order items. This is the joins, right? This is line items that have been ordered. And I do the same trick here. So I make two items, sorry, I make two line items that use the zeroth item of my previously created item list. So I call the order item factory, but now I override this attribute. The order item factory knows how to make an item it's, itself. Um, here's the factory. So the order item factory 
calls association dot item or dot association item, this means it would actually figure out there's an association and it creates the item on the fly. But I can choose to override this, and in this case, I want to control my test data because I want to make sure I have the item zero ordered exactly two times. So I, I choose to override this here. This is another feature of Factory Girl. You can override any setup data you already have in the factory. And then I make the, the second item five times, and the third item I order one time. So I have a total of, here's my validation of the test data. I have a total of eight line items on the order, and I should have a total of three items in the database. And now I can make my test. So this is all set up here. This is all set up just to make some sensible background data for this test. And this test now finds items by popularity, in order of popularity. And uh, I ordered the second item the most. I ordered it five times. Uh, so that should be first. Then I ordered uh, the first item twice. That should be second. And then I ordered the third item once. That should be last. That's the return. OK, so how is this implemented? Uh, here's the item. So I use the name scope. You notice I call something here on the, uh, I'm calling something on the class itself, on item, capital item, dot something. That, that is, needs to be a class method or a name scope. Um, and I call this by popularity. And the way it goes is, first of all, I need to count something else. I need to count the number of order items that this item showed up on. So I include that table. And then I want to return them by count. So I actually order, the ordering of the result is given by the number of item IDs that showed up on the order items. And then I need to group them so that it collapses the uh, values. What this basically does, it, it makes an outer join that is the superset of both tables. And uh, that means it has many repetitions on it. And then I want to collapse the repetitions based on the item ID. That's what the group by does. I had uh, on the last uh, week's presentation, I had a bunch of slides that I actually didn't go over because I ran out of time, but they're in the presentation if you want to study that a little more. So grouping is common when you do some sort of aggregate operation. The count here is basically a, a summing up of the line item. That's an aggregate operation. And typically, whenever you have an aggregate, you need to group by something, sort of the standard SQL rule. So the question is, how do I write these specs first, and how do I start implementing? Uh, the way I started, I wrote first, um, I first wrote the validation rules. That's simple, right? And then actually on this one, I don't even didn't even bother. I started with the customer. Where is it? Let's, let's pull up the customer and the order spec. Order spec. So here, I started with. It has a customer. So as I put this line on here. That would force me to put the belongs to. And then I also uh, put here the number and the order spec, right? Then I put here the order should have many items. So it should respond to items. That forces me to put the has many items on the order. Now, then this is still declarative, right? There's actually no database queries running yet. So then at some point, I want to make sure it retrieves the items. And now I need some data in the database to, to make actually a, a search to run a SQL query. Um, I ended up implementing the order item. So then I started with the factories. So I, I, I wrote the declarative specs that require me to put the belongs to and the has many in place, step one. Step one is declarative. Make it fail, then throw. Then we fa see it fail. Okay. Then we put the has many belongs to there. That's all part of step one. Step one ABC. Right. <laughs> okay. And then step two is I want to actually make a real search that requires me to have data. And then I start with the factory. So step two I actually start with the factories. I'm going to make some factories uh, that you know can make orders and items. So here's the order. Actually, I made a customer factory also. Here's the customer. Then there's the order, and they have these associations. So the factory is going to rely on these associations to be in place. 
But then thanks to the factory, I get all the execution of the associations. So I don't have to test it each way. I tested it basically here, that the order dot items, that is going to test, and then I have item is order dot items. So this is going to test the association both ways, for the lookup, actual lookup. So on the item side, I don't have to put the same test. It will be redundant. So the question is, do you actually implement the name scope first if you understand the database well, or do you bother with the test? Because the complicated part of the test, as you noticed, is this setup, right, the data setup. That's the complicated part, yeah. Um, up to you. If you feel really comfortable with, it, with what you're doing, like, I agree with you that uh, this code up here, the name scope looks a lot cleaner than this data setup. This looks very simple and intuitive. So depending on your comfort level and the complexity of this query, you, the choice whether you want to test it in depth or not is yours. Uh, I generally would, like this kind of thing, I might, I might actually not do the test if this weren't for a class, but if it gets more complicated and I have bugs in there at some point, then it's time for a test. Especially if you get some weird queries and they don't match what your expectation is, then rather than hacking, so that should be the clue, right? If you get bugs that you didn't anticipate, that's the clue that you don't have enough test coverage. And, and this happens sometimes. So for the class, I would definitely, you know, try to do it. Um, in real life, this one is probably okay, but the customer one, let's segue and then let's move on. Uh, the customer one has two named scopes, depending on how you did it. So the customer had three different queries supposed to be on it. Like, you're supposed to find all the, all the items that a customer ever ordered in their lifetime. That actually is not representable with a named scope or has many because it would be two has many throughs, which is not supported. The customer has many orders, the order has many order items, and the order items belong to an item. That's four tables. That would require from the customer to the order, the, from the customer to the item, would require two hops. And there's no such thing in Rails. Rails only supports the has many through is one hop, one join table. And you can spend time to try to make it work, but it doesn't work and uh, it's not supported right now. Last bit, so let's quickly talk about the customer. And you know, this code is on GitHub, so if you, feel free to study this if you want. And uh, you can discuss it on the email list. Uh, I wanted to do just some stuff about loyalty. So customer loyalty can be defined in two ways. Can be defined in the customer has ordered stuff recently, or the customer has ordered a minimum number of things over their lifetime. The way I wrote this requirement is actually to check that the customer has ordered more than two things within the last 90 days. But actually life becomes easier if you break them apart into two things. And then they can be composable named scopes. You can make one named scope for the customer ordering stuff in the last 90 days and another named scope for the customer ordering stuff, ordering more than n items ever. And then the named scopes, as I said last time, are composable so you can join right together. And then all their conditions merge together. That makes the testing a lot easier. Um, so what I did here is I have one order, and that order already makes it customer because the factory knows how to set the association up correctly. <coughs> so I grabbed the order, uh, I grabbed the customer from that order. I also made a second order. Now here I overrode the creation time. That order was created 91 days ago. It's old, it's older than our cutoff time. And I make two items, and I give the first order these two items. So I say order items create, this is the active record association create method. So I have two orders, one order is old, the second order has two items. Order two, now is to create a different customer? Yes, good question. The, uh, does order two know how to create a new customer? I mean, it, it puts in a different customer. It puts in a different customer, right? The factory does this for you automatically. Every time you call every time you call something with a factory association on it, here, this will actually make a new object. Oh, that's all you have to do. That's all you have to do, yeah. Order association customer will create a new customer every time. If you want the same customer, you have to explicitly override it here with the same customer uh, on, on that line. Has the customer been loyal within the last 90 days? Has this customer ordered anything in the last 90 days? The customer two, 
which is owned, which owns the order to, has an order that's older than 90 days. So that customer shouldn't be considered loyal under this rule. Customer one is the only one who has a current order. All right? And then the second one, we want to find all the customers who have ordered at least two items in their entire history. I call that the min two items uh, scope. And that too is the customer one. Uh, the customer one, on order one here, which belongs to customer one, had the two items on it. Now I want to find the combined customer now who has both. So who is both loyal in the last 90 days and has at least two items on it. So I can join these named scopes together here. That's the cool part about named scopes. This is why if you make your own def self.find custom, it won't work. Okay, so here's the query, right? Select star, select people dot yada yada, and it makes these funny uh, renamings. This is an, a hallmark of active records include feature. It renames everything. Don't worry about that. It's kind of a long query. Okay, from, right? So here's from people. That's our primary table. Now left outer joins the orders on it. It joins all the orders that have this customer ID. Then a left outer joins the orders on this with cust customer ID. What's orders people? Oh yeah, right. Okay. Then we order join the order items. And lastly, we have the condition. Orders created at, that's our 90 day rule, like this is uh, May, so th 90 days ago. And type customer that is stuck in thanks to the active record. Um, and here's our group by count. This is the thing that checks that, uh, yikes. This is the thing that checks that we have at least two, two items ordered. So they actually, within the 90 days, yeah. So they end up being joined together. So this rule is a condition. This is part of the and, and this is the other thing is the, is a part of a, a group by having clause. So if you do something with a grouped, a, a grouped, uh, if you want to, uh, sorry, if you want to do an aggregate for a where condition, you have to use having instead of where. Um, so implementation, implementation, and then let's move on. Here's the having, one second, um, and here's the group. So this is the second rule about the two items. And above here was the first rule for the 90 days. By popular request, we're going to talk about mocks, doubles, and stubs. Complete shift of gears now. So what are, what are mocks, doubles, and stubs? <laughs> Generally, these are things that are used as stand-ins when the real object is not available, too expensive, uh, or otherwise um, not, not helpful or not practical. Um, we'll talk a little bit about when they make sense and when they don't make sense, but for now I want to actually introduce the machinery behind it. At the object level, you can create a mock just like this. It comes with RSpec. There's different kinds of mocking frameworks, but for now we're going to use a built-in one, and it's not hard. It's not rocket science. Mock is just an object like this. And um, just to confuse you, mock, a mock, stub, a mock, and double a mock is all the exact same thing. So when used like this, mock, stub, and double, or double, no different. Uh, when I learned this, it created great confusion to me that the word stub seems to be used in different contexts to mean different things. Um, and if you read the literature, there's a lot of literature on it. Uh, that, that uses the terms uh, differently, and they always use them in their own little flavor. Uh, the RSpec book has a pretty good chapter on this. I think chapter 13, which I recommend you read, is in, in the list of reading uh, for later here at the end. Um, 
But at its most basic, you can create a mock like this. So what do you want to do with a thing like this? How is this useful? This is useful by being able to put methods on it. This thing is just an object, and it can pretend to have methods. So it's called a mock. It's a stand-in for something. Okay, how do we use these guys? Here. So mock's kind of method stub. So I create my mock here, and then I say m.stub. Now notice the meaning of stub is different here. Up here, I call stub without anything before it. That means I call it on the global object. So now, given a mock, I can call stub on this, and this means something different. This means give this mock a function, a method called foo. So now this mock object pretends to have a method foo, and I can call it m.foo, returns nil. I can have this method return something also by adding end return. So I can say m.stub foo and return something. And this something here is then returned every time I call it m.foo. Now you can also have a shortcut notation. Rather than first creating the object and then calling .stub on it, you can do it all one go. You can give this mock uh, a list of parameters uh, of methods and the return value that it should have, like this. Um, what is this string used for in here? The a mock, as I call it in here. This string is totally arbitrary. It's totally up to you, and it shows up in the error reporting. So if there's an error message and the stub doesn't have a method or didn't expect a method or it expected more than something, then it shows up there. So it's, it's primarily useful for error reporting, and you should pick it accordingly uh, to, to generate meaningful error messages. OK, so let's do a little example. Let's first go to message expectations. So on the, on the previous slide, we just had a method. So now mock has a method which can be called or not be called. Part of the reason we use mocks is that we want to verify that some implementation gets invoked or not invoked. So we can put a message expectation on it, as it's called. And the message expectation basically means here that M, the mock, should receive foo, the message foo. What does this mean? This means M should be called with foo one time. By default, it means one time. You can also tell it it should be called twice or exactly five times. So in the course of your test, whatever you're testing, there should be a side effect that calls this thing five times, or never, or once. And you can also have it return something. So these are all composable again. You can say, should receive foo dot twice and return something. So far so good? So arguments, you asked about arguments, right? Yes, we can also do argument expectations. So this thing should return, as should be called, with something. So the with can be various things. It can be here a regular expression, for example. So this means the foo method should have a string argument, and that value should match this regular expression. Or the value we call it with should be a hash that includes this key value pair. This is another way we can set up method expectations. Typically, the mock is used to stand in for some deeper implementation that needs to be called with an exact set of parameters. Like, the mock might be used for a database operation that needs to create an object. It should be called with the right parameters to create the object, and it should return some other object that has certain properties. So this is you know, how we can guarantee that the caller is putting the correct arguments in. The with has a block syntax also, where you could take the arguments apart one by one if you need to do that. So you can say the argument one should be something, argument two should be something else, and if all else fails. So what we've so far done, we have operated on these mock objects. So these mock objects are, are null entities, really, that do nothing until we tell them what methods they should have or what methods they should expect to be called on. However, you can use this trick about should receive the message expectation. You could use this on any object. It doesn't have to be a mock. It can be called on some other object. For example, I might have a time. The time is a Ruby class. And I can stub the now method. And I can return some arbitrary time. 
This is useful if I need to reset the time counter and I need to like, you know, check exact, like my, my code adds 90 days to, to it. Like we, we used it uh, in the example, although there it was only a difference. If you need an absolute time, you could uh, use this trick to freeze the time basically. Why is this Ah, uh, thank you, somebody noticed. So why is there a stub dot bang here? Exclamation mark when the previous slides had just stub without the bang. It adds the function on the time class, yes. When you call time.now, you, you now get the stub function and the stub return value. With that, let's do a little example. So these things can be used anywhere and I will tell you in a bit when and when not to use them. So for now, I'm just going to make a, you know, we'll just make an example right now that exercise the feature set. I'm not going to actually mock anything reasonable. I, I tried coming up with a sensible example where I actually would use this in practice and I couldn't come up with one. You know, I spent all week thinking about it. And so, which, which tells you something, that this stuff is overused by far, overused. If you read the RSpec book, they have a different opinion. Read the book uh, and then come back to class and we'll discuss it. Um, I find this mostly useless, but there's a few, like the time is a good one. There's a few where it has merit. Uh, with that, uh, we will create a uh, little example, uh, which is going to be in your project after class. I'm going to upload it. So I just created a lib folder in the spec, um, and that's cool. You can test. You can test uh, the library method. So um, somebody asked me last time uh, that the wasn't clear to them that the spec folders actually mirror pretty exactly the application folders. So we have a models folder and the application has a models folder, right? Later on today, we're gonna to have a controllers folder in the spec also. Um, there's gonna be a views folder. There's a lib folder here, which typically contains libraries, you know, mo modules um, that get included in other things that don't really fit into a model, they get put there. And you can make a corresponding lib uh, test folder for them to test them. Right now, I'm just going to exercise the feature set. I'm not actually going to uh, have a, a library that this is backed by. Okay, let's see what we're going to do. Actually, let's call it using mocks. Can you guys read this? There we go. So, So uh, we can do inline method stubs as I just described earlier on the slide. So mock, oops, lowercase mock, a mock, and I can put an inline method on it. So the parameters here are a hash and uh, I can return things from them. I could also return, you know, objects from them. I could return whatever I want. You know, this is, this is, we're living in Ruby land here. Um, now, this method, now we're in our specs, we can very, I can verify this. This method should respond to foo. And uh, when I call it, it should actually give me that value, eight. So far, so good. Now, we didn't write a failing test because we're not actually testing anything. We're trying to exercise the framework a little bit. As I said, I couldn't come up with a sensible example of this that is um, accessible. I'm just gonna show you a few, a few features that you can do with these things. Um, so with explicit stub methods, so we can also create the mock um, uh, with explicit methods. So I can say stub foo, and I can say stub can also use bang for change, bar, and that can return something. Bar and return. So the first thing returns an L, this one will return uh, hello world. And so now, um, well, now uh, M should respond to foo and also bar, and um, let's try an actual error in there so we see something useful, right? Okay. 
So uh, line uh, 16 failed. It says expected the mock, here it references the mock, of this name to respond to bar with two R. And uh, it has no such method stub on it, and therefore it failed. If I uh, correct this to be R, um, it then does that. Pretty simple stuff. Let's do something with expectations. It expects invocations Thank you. But invoke is a K, right? Yeah. Okay, so now let's say uh, should receive should receive foo. Let's see how that goes. So if I expect that foo should be called, let's see what happens here. It says mock expected foo once but received it zero times. And that's because it wasn't called. Now if I call it, I'm hungry, I guess. Um, if I call it, then uh, it passes. Yeah, so what this will do, it'll actually, this will instantiate the method. I don't have to put stub. The should receive replaces the stub, and additionally, it makes this counter. It, it checks how many times I've been called. So, it, so within that it statement. Within this it statement, yeah. So typically, this is how your tests will typically go, because here you might call some, you know, here you might call some person, person dot complicated <laughs> operation which somewhere deep down is call stack, it should call this full thing. And then uh, the complicated operation, you, you don't know if it's calling foo or not, but you, you know that it needs to do it to be correct. And then the should receive will check, did it actually get called anywhere in the call stack? This is also the problem with mocks, the test implementation. You, as the test developer here, you have to know the call stack, that something should happen or should not happen deep down the implementation, which is the first and biggest problem with mocks. Like How is this useful when I'm not? So it is useful, generally, mocks are useful to test some external dependency that is difficult to replicate. A good example is APIs. Like, you're trying to call some API like Twitter, um, and now you're on an airplane, you're offline, and you want to run your test suite, and it's failing miserably because it's waiting for Twitter. Um, and so you want to write your test suite that don't depend on these external things that you don't have replicatable in your test environment. The database typically doesn't qualify because you do have a test database. And uh, my gripe about overusing of mocks is often with databases. Um, and it's, it's typically, uh, uh, it's problematic there because then you're trying to test implementation rather than testing outcome. Uh, the idea of mocks is that you can test an object in isolation and you remove all the dependencies so the other objects don't have to be loaded or don't get accessed. Like we tried with our has many belongs to relationships, we, we ended up with tests that involve multiple tables at the same time. And mocking is one way you could remove those dependencies. Yes, that is one intention of them and it is also a problem with them. The dangers of mocks, they go stale. Uh, the problem is that if you mock out the dependency, that's all nice and well when you start from scratch, but now you implement the, the guts actually that this is thing is trying to mock, and now the guts chain and the mock, the mock is, is not updated. It's actually extra work and it's tedious to keep the mock in sync. It's almost like copy and paste code duplication. It's not dry. It's not a, it's not a dry approach to uh, doing it. And if you control, if you don't control the other dependency, if you're talking to Twitter API, you have no chance. You have to mock it because you cannot uh, you know, re-implement that on your own. But if you do control the dependency, like if you are talking to has many orders and you have the orders also in your same code application, then the case for mocks is much reduced in my opinion. Um, except for maybe asterisk, perhaps if your test suite runs three hours or four hours and maybe you need a performance improvement. So the question is, uh, isn't the argument that uh, mocks have to be updated and kept in sync. Isn't that the same argument as with unit tests that they have to be updated and kept in sync? Yes, but you're using the unit test to test the code. Now, if you're putting the mock in between, you're now using the unit test to test the, to test the mock. You're no longer testing the code. So now if the code changes, 
or improves, your test coverage is, is, has a gap. Yeah, so now, of course, the counter argument is, well, now you need two levels of test. You need the unit test with your nice little marks, and you need this umbrella test that tests everything again. That goes back to my first slide on uh, week one. Where is your dollar for the, you know, where is your bang for the buck here? Like the value per line of code, or test code. Sure, you can write unit tests, you know, you can write integration tests. What I'm teaching you is the pragmatic value driven approach that if you don't do these things, you get away with less unit tests, with less umbrella testing, with less integration testing. I find the value per line of integration testing is an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude reduced from the value of a line of unit tests that actually do test dependencies. So that value argument is completely missing from that discussion about MOX and you know, outside in and BDD and you know, all that stuff. I have not seen that anywhere in the literature. And so far, because it's not there, it tells me this is academic and textbook at the moment. It hasn't matured to the level of pragmatic, actually everyday development. And what this class is about, what I'm about, is to teach you the value-driven approach. You know what? If you have a limited amount of time, a limited budget, and a required feature set to implement, how do you do this most effectively with these test tools so that you still have good test coverage, you still have a low cost of change, you still have an agile process, you don't give up of any of these tenets, and you still do it in a pragmatic, value-driven way. I, I, let, I got led down this path by the RSpec scaffold tests. RSpec scaffold, uh, when you generate it, who has played with RSpec scaffold, or any scaffold for that matter? It's, it's a way to, to generate one slice through the application. It, it makes a migration, a model, a controller, views. It makes one slice through, RESTful, CRUD, everything. Uh, and the, if you do the RSpec way, the RSpec scaffold, it comes with controller tests. And they all mock out the models. And I inherited a project once that had this you know, in it. And I thought, oh, cool, I hadn't seen this approach. So I kept going with it. And then what you said happened. You know, the controllers, the dependencies, the, the data objects going through the controllers got bigger and bigger and bigger and more complicated. They had like multiple levels, levels of nested attributes in them. And it's at some point, my mocks got so complicated and illegible that I wasn't sure anymore, do they actually test the real thing or do they test the fake thing? And and I really, it became a dependency and maintenance problem. And at that point, I discovered, you know, factories also. And I thought, you know, screw all this. Let's put a factory in. With one factory call, you can instantiate an entire hierarchy of objects. You know, that perhaps takes a little bit of time to run every time. But computers are cheap, you know. Runtime is cheap. Developer time is not. And so it comes back to this developer economics, you know. When do you shoot yourself least in the foot? And this is why I like this, this slide, you know, it's, you actually get electrocuted on this sometimes without even knowing it ha it's happening. And um, so we basically discussed the arguments. I'd love to have this conversation more, you know, in, in public, and there's, there's people out there who write books uh, who have another opinion. But my thinking is that the value-driven approach has a very limited judicious use of mocks. Problems, we mentioned it. Simulate versus actual API. So I'm testing against the simulate API. Who main, who's in charge of maintaining the simulate API? It's like copy and pasted code. Uh, nobody, right? Nobody guarantees that. Um, perhaps an integration test, but that's extra work just to have this feature, to, to use this mock feature, the value of which is questionable in the first place. Um, tedious to remove after outside in phase. Another grab of mine, this outside in thing, I think it's all academics. Read it in the books. Um, this outside in approach, I'm not gonna explain it, read it. Uh, I believe it's nice to, to write about and to play with in textbooks, but I don't see it actually working because after you have your outside in cut through the application with Cucumber, um, you then have to replace all the mocks at some point or you have this test, co this test coverage gap again. So extra work for no value. Um, we end up testing implementation. Generally not a good idea. We wanna test interfaces. Um, and then you require exploratory and integration testing, which you might get away with in most cases if you don't do it. Um, so here, less value plan of test code. That's the bottom line. It's an economics argument, really. Um, so what are they good for after, after I get off my soapbox here a little bit? They are good for external APIs. I mentioned this, right? They, are, they are sometimes are useful for system services, like the time. If you want to make an absolute time, or you have to abstract some sort of I.O. thing, like a file, you know, you could give... Rather than making a file on disk, you could pretend there's a file and it has a read function on it that returns a string or something. That could be useful sometimes. Um, and you can use them for, and you know, with, with the big bang here, sufficiently mature internal APIs. You inherit a large application that has been there for a while. 
the internal APIs that are used by millions of clients, you know, tons of developers, they're not going to change every day. For those, especially if these functions are very high level and long time running, you might be able to put a mock in just to increase your developer efficiency a little bit. But again, the bottom line is what makes the most business value per line of code written. And that's always the bottom line. Let's talk about controllers. That's what I promised today, right? Controllers. Um, controllers are actually really simple. I spend a lot of time on models because the model is complicated. It should have, it should have all the complicated logic in it. It's the place for the business logic. It's the pace, place for fat, complicated things. The controller is simple, skinny, as, as the paradigm says. The controllers are basically pass-through entities. Stuff goes in, stuff goes out. The controller shouldn't care. It really shouldn't care what goes through. It's generally boilerplate code. If your controllers are not boilerplate code, then they're no longer passed through entities, and then you're making your life a lot harder than it needs to be. Um, they follow this controller formula pattern, which is what? Uh, I'm going to explain it on, on two flavors. So we have, generally in controllers, we have the restful actions. We have reads and we have writes, mostly, most generally. The, the reads are things like, show me one item, show me all items, show me a form to create a new item, or show me a form to update an existing item. Those are all reads in the database. Uh, typically, they're coming with a get request. Um, you can also update an existing item that comes with a put request, or you can make a new one with a post request, and you can delete one with a delete request. I like this acronym though, REST, right? It means that um, all resource-based applications, it's actually an acknowledgement that all resource-based applications are going to have a common <coughs> set of operations on them, namely the CRUD operations. That's not rocket science. This is far, far superior than any custom stuff that people did with, with uh, Corba or SOAP or whatnot. I would call REST the 21st or late 21st century model of inner process communication, uh, superseded by or, or uh, uh, yes, yeah, superseded and evolved from all the problems we had with things like Corba and DCOM and that, that heavy heavy duty stuff, which is high in ceremony but low in convention. Like if you do Corba, you still don't get any standardized accessors for read, write, you know, update and delete. You have to say get object blah and bar blah. If you ever implemented a SOAP interface um, or have to, had to deal with one, you would pull your hair out over all the different ways that people can get objects when slash ID would just be enough. Um, and it's all custom. There's no conventions on this stuff. Or maybe there is, but it's, it's high ceremony, lots of compilers and things. None of this is necessary. REST is a simple way of inner process communication. Or inner service communication, even. Okay, so with that, what is the controller formula? The controller formula for, for reads follows in two steps. One is the test, and we have a pattern for this test. So if you have a read operation, how do we test for this? So A, we make the request in the controller. Then we check what renders. Typically, that either means a template gets rendered, or maybe there's a redirect, or perhaps there's some sort of status code that gets exchanged. Um, like in, in JSON or in uh, XML, you typically send status codes back. Um, and maybe there's a content type also. If you don't do HTML, you have to set the content type and you want to verify, verify that. This is the stuff you test and test. The last thing you want to test in the test is that the right variables get loaded and assigned. Why is that important? It's because the controller feeds the view and the view typically needs a variable or a couple of variables to display the stuff they're going to display. And we want to make sure that the controller has all this at the, at the starting gate. And when we do this, the controller, what that's left over is really, really simple. The controller code is just find some data based on some parameters, assign it to variables, and render something. That's it. That's generally all the controllers on the read side are ever going to do. Now let's quickly do one of those examples. Okay, so now we have our database application that has a person in it, but we have no way to actually create person, a person from the interface. So what I want to do is I want to create a controller um, that you know, lets me talk to the person. And I'm going to start with the read controllers, and I'm going to use RubyMine to make a uh, controller. There you go. This is the same as script generator. So 
script generate con RSpec controller will give you the same interface. And I want to make a people controller plural because the controllers are typically pluralized. And I want to give it the uh, four read restful default actions, namely index, show, index shows all, show just shows one, new and edit. New is a form for a new thing, edit is a form for existing thing. And I add this to get and we go. Why is it skip? Skip means if there's already a file by the same name, don't override it. Yeah, delete is not a read operation. It's a uh, it's a delete operation. So I'm going to talk about the reads for now. Yeah, and then we're going to talk about the create in a second. So it made some uh, it made some tests for me here. That's that, that's these are these are actually usable, sort of. Um, okay, so get index. What should it do? It should be successful. That's great news. Um, it should also perhaps um, actually render some template that's useful. So let's check for that. So I'm, right now I'm, I'm in the controller test pattern. I'm making the get request, and then I check for the four things I need to check. The response, the template, and the variable. That's actually only three. Um, so I'm going to verify it renders, it renders the, whoops, index, index template to get index. So you can use this uh, symbol notation or the string notation up there. It's the same. And then RSpec gives us a helper. This is RSpec Rails. It helps us uh, with uh, rendering stuff. Should render template. And you give it the string of the template that it should render. Great. Also, this is index. The convention says index should show a list of everything. So we should, um, it assigns variables. It assigns a people variable, variable. And uh, currently my database is actually blank, so I probably have to have a little uh, factory here that creates some something. Let's make one person, P. And now I make the get request. And now I want to verify that the controller variable at people got set. So the controller will eventually set a people variable. How can I verify this from the test? Um, I cannot say add people here because this environment, this object, is not the controller object that runs. That's different from the RSpec test. Uh, sorry, that's different from the RSpec model test where the model that you're manipulating is the same that gets passed to the code. So here, we're talking to a controller, which is kind of a separate entity. We're talking to it through an outside get request. It actually makes a get request. Now we need to take a sneak peek inside the controller to figure out what member variables are set. And RSpec gives us a helper for this called assigns. Assigns with a colon of the symbol. And then that can be something. That should be, in this case, an array of people. Does this make sense? So the assigns variable, the thing returned by assign by the assigns function reports the at people instance variable of the controller. So interestingly, most of the stuff actually passed, right? Which tells you something about the value of these custom, uh, it tells you something about the value of these canned tests. Um, so yeah, these canned tests, I think I'll talk about this in a sec, too much, too, too little. The only thing that failed is this because the, uh, the controller doesn't assign the variable. Let's look at the controller. The people controller. This is the controller code, which has the method definitions pretty empty. The only thing I want now is the people variable needs to be set to person.all. So it's supposed to return all people. Right? This is a database lookup. This is the model class. It's the finder. Let's see if that works. Sweet. Okay. Now I can do the same for show, you know, new, edit. Let's do one for new. 
So we have show new. So what is the new operation supposed to do? Well, it should render template new. Great. Which actually is not very helpful because uh, this is the default. Testing defaults is not, not I think it's over testing. template new, but then the key bit of the new controller action is it assigns a new person object. That's the key bit. So we want to uh, we want to verify uh, should what? Should, well, first of all, should be set, right? Not be nil would be good. And then it should probably be a person. Ah, the question is, right, so should, should I count here if a person got created? Good question. No. There, there is two actions responsible for creating a new entity in the database. There is the display of the form to the user, which is what we're doing. That's the get request. And then there is the post request that re reports the data to the server. That's the post request to the create action, which we haven't done yet. There's always two, um, that ping pong, same for edit and update. The edit displays the form to the user with the existing data populated, but that's still a get request. And then the put is the update that changes in the database. So we'll do that in a sec. Um, so it assigns this and um, should be kind of person. So the other thing is, to your point, Joop, um, this should be a new record. This should not been not been saved yet. I think this is the most interesting bit about this whole uh, new test. And uh, it's failing right now on line 44. The person should not be nil, but it is nil because it hasn't been assigned. So let's make a person. At person, person dot new. All right. So um, that is the beginning of this. So what I said earlier is there's these all these tests in here that don't seem to do much, and my preference would be to not bother with get new response success and get should run a template because this is the pure default. If I do nothing in the controller, just have the method declaration, it does this by itself. This is the default. We don't need to test defaults. That just clutters the tests. And um, I'm going to close with this today and we're going to resume next, next week with the rest of the stuff. Um, and I'll leave you with some reading.